uh, Marcus is with me, Marcus Wilson, serious producer of Doctor Who. And we're going, in a moment, we're going to play you a tape of when the three of us, Marcus, who knows the set well anyway, less of a thrill for him, and myself and Mitch, went inside to the interior bit of the TARDIS, which is Studio 4 here at uh, BBC Cardiff. Um, we're going to be on the, the, live on the wards of casualty in a bit as well. Marcus, quite a few people on, the twi- on Twitter, we were talking to Jenna Louise Coleman, the new assistant a moment ago, saying, when will the Doctor himself, or her, <laughs> when will the Doctor be a woman? I think anything's possible in the future. No, but you, isn't, isn't it about time? It, it, Why don't you call for that to happen? Well, I think, you know, at the moment, Matt Smith's the Doctor. We want him to stay the Doctor as long as possible. So. And then? Anything's possible. <laughs> Mitch? What would fans think to that? Well, fans think that. I think they'd get used to it. I think it would, uh, I think it would kick off initially and eventually they'd get over it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, I don't know if we, we've actually sorted out enough about time law biology to know whether that's even possible. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, listen, let's, uh, by the way, the next one, the ne- technically the next one is the last one, isn't it? Because a doctor can only regenerate. Can he regenerate 12 or 13 times? Uh, it's supposed to be 12 regenerations, which will give you 13 doctors, but there's all kinds of dispute as to how canon that actually is. Canon is, is a word in Doctor Who fandom. Yeah, well, it was yeah. Stephen Moffat, the exec producer writer, always has that line about, if ever he's asked at a Q&A, how are you going to get around that? He, his answer is, we'll just make something up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we went to, with his 2.39 and about an hour ago, we went onto the set of The TARDIS. OK, so well, we're at Studio 4, Marcus. Uh, this is over at Rothlock. Yeah, BBC Rothlock. Yeah. And we're now outside The TARDIS. And I don't mean the police box, I mean, we're outside the interior of The TARDIS. We are indeed, yeah, the uh, the. Fun- fantastic set that Michael Pickwell has designed for us. Yeah. I think you've got to go in through the blue doors. It's the only way to go in. Oh, yeah. Well, they finally, sorry, they've, they finally did that shot in the Christmas show that they've been meaning to do since they brought it back of doing Absolutely. a tracking shot from outside straight through the doors and into it, which is something they've only really been able to do for the last couple of years. And just so, so to explain, so we've come into this in Studio 4, which is enormous, and it's, it's like a hangar. It's empty because the show starts filming again in April. There is, at the far side, an actual police box, yeah. the actual just regular stand standard Just size blue, blue police box, box. Yeah. And but now we come to the other side of the studio and the first thing that strikes you is just the ex- how enormous yeah. We're not in there yet. No, but all we've seen so far, just to give you an idea, all we've seen so far is like a big sort of aircraft hangar and in the middle of it is what looks like an enormous scaffolding sphere. Yeah. There's just like a sort of a sphere of sort of planks and scaffolding and we've walked up this um, this sort of tin ladder at the outside of it and we're now in a sort of little corridor and at the end of this corridor there is just one side of a police box. Yes. There's just the doors. Yeah. So I assume that those are the doors which form the exterior doors of the TARDIS once you get into the set. Right. The That's, That's all correct, right. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it's a good of scaffolding around this bit. Mitch, I imagine a Doctor Who fan, this is, this, is this the happiest day of your life? Uh, I think probably my kids being born is probably still going to have to trumpet, but I'm, I'm going to put it at number three, certainly. <laughs> uh, so Marcus, Marcus, you want to... Open the doors for us. So there, the doors open. Oh, look at that. Oh, look, we really are in the TARDIS. Oh, I love this set. I love this set. They, they, they unveiled this on the Christmas show, and I love it because it basically, it looks like a classic 1980s TARDIS with, with a lot more money spent on it. Yeah, it's it? beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. I love the look of this. Marcus, that is true. This reminds me of the, my, my doctor. Mm-hmm. People always refer to their first doctor as my doctor, don't which, they? Often? Which one was your doctor? Peter Davidson. Uh-huh. Yeah, but yeah. I seem to remember it looked a little bit like this. Yeah, there are certain kind of, I think, nods to the past. Michael was very keen to to kind of get bits of every every time there's a legacy in here. So what have we got? Uh, well, this is the central console. Is is you know, classic it's the classic yeah. six-sided. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we have uh, we've we've we're now talking on another level of oh, yeah. of Doctor Who fandom. This is the classic, classic six-sided, six-sided console. central console. Well, when it came back in 2005, it was six-sided, but it was circular, and a lot of people were entirely happy with that. And then for the beginning of the Matt era, they had they went back to sort of six straight sides. But this is like six straight sides on all kind of white metal, so it really is like a sort of classic TARDIS interior. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so Mitch is touching it all now. Oh, He's touching yes. each each one of the six. Sides. Everybody who comes in here wants to touch it. I think the, the, you know, the design is so tactile. Yeah. Everybody wants to play with it. So there's a thing here that looks like a sort of like a throttle on an aeroplane, which Mitch has just been moving. Um, Marcus, what, what does that represent here? This, this, this was a bit of kind of alien tech. I mean, when it's, when it's working, it's, it's all lit up and filled with the kind of goo, which you know, the doctor can use to kind of commune with the, 
the brain of the TARDIS. Okay, what the, in the centre of the central console, Mitch, there's classically been this time cylinder. Yes. What, what, what is it? Uh, well, actually, uh, this is called a time rotor. Well, a time. Well, actually, no. There's a bit of dispute as to whether the time rotor is that thing or whether the time rotor is the thing above it. I think it's safer just to refer to that as the central column. But what they've they've also put in this new design is this vast rotating ceiling section, and that's new. That's that's a lovely little bit of animated thing. You got to go. Does that actually go round and round? Was it CG? No, it actually goes round and round physically. Oh, lovely! Yeah. Yeah. It's very loud, but it, it does work. Yeah, yeah. Um, with, I mean, it, it's not a huge leap, is it, from the last set that you had? I mean, I, I assume there's only so far you can do it going completely redesigning it. Yeah, there's, I mean, there are certain things you have to do with the TARDIS. As Mitch said, you've got to have the central console, you've got to have the column. Um, you've, got to, you know, you've got a certain design to work within, but each one wants to evolve and, and reflect the character of the Doctor. It, certain things which are constant, like uh, you've, you've got hexagonal roundels now. The, 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 and the classic series, basically, there's always been a kind of a circular recessed design to the walls. And if, if you look, what they've done with this one is they're hexagonal like a big honeycomb, but you've got those sort of round lamp things and they sort of flash in sequence when the whole thing's switched on, don't they? Oh, that's lovely. Let me, and we're not allowed to take any photos on here because you only no, want... No, nobody is that, to take any photos in here. And it, well, but this is so photographed anyway. This is obviously yeah. seen by millions of yeah. people. What is the reason for that? I think the reason is we want the TARDIS to be seen to, in its best light. I yeah. mean, literally, the, the lighting is a huge part of the set, and we, we want the photos you know, to look like it does on, on screen. Yeah, with the lighting today, nor yeah. the official lights are on. It's it almost as if there's bad. been a fire and the emergency lighting has it's come on. Sparse, it, it's yeah. a bit sparse. <laughs> Do you, when you see those sort of classic scenes in here where... The, <laughs> Mitch just said, oh, lovely, as he's, he's turned some kind of brass <laughs> dial. Um, it's that's all very a, practical. Um, it's almost like a beautiful... But it's, like, it's like the interior of a Swiss watch, isn't Somebody's it, that bit? He's left behind a copy of Doctor Who and the Tenth Planet. Yeah. Interesting. There's a copy of a Doctor Who book on the set. Indeed. Marcus, yeah. let me ask you this. When the TARDIS collides with something or there's an explosion or it catches fire and the whole thing shakes and wobbles, how is that achieved? Does this whole, does this whole thing wobble or is that just pure acting? I wish, no. It's all pure acting. It's all down to Matt and Jenna. And, and, camera, yeah, and cam good cameramen. Good cameramen, yes. Um, the BBC, this is a relatively new studio, isn't it? The mm, BBC's it is, been yeah. here for about a year. Yeah, that's right. So how much of Doctor Who has been filmed here so far? We filmed, we came here during the start of the last series, so um, we were filming here from Asylum of the Daleks. Okay. Oh, so not that long. Yeah, no, not so it's all brand new. Yeah. Um, so this is, so did you initially bring, you had to take down the old TARDIS set and bring it here and reassemble it? No, no, it, we, the old TARDIS set, which we used for Asylum through to the Angel Take Manhattan. Um, was the old kind of golden TARDIS, yeah. and that was up a, up, a, up a boat. So when we moved, it was it, what? It was up a boat. The old studios. Up a boat. So I thought it meant it was yeah. on top of a boat. No, no, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. Um, but we knew that to take that out of that studio when we moved studios would just destroy the set. So rather than you know destroy a set and, re and rebuild a perfect copy, it was a perfect opportunity to to build a new TARDIS. Right. So you were sort of filming between the two studios yeah, for a while, we were, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. And what happens to that old set now? Then now that it's done with? I don't know to be honest. I'm sure it goes somewhere very safe and secure. But I know a lot of it was destroyed in the in the sort of uh, removal of it. Was it? Well, the, 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 the David Tennant console room sort of put in a guest appearance in The Doctor's Wife, the one that Neil wrote, didn't it? So I take it that the, 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 the first Matt one is not intact enough to be resurrected in a similar fashion, is it? Well, you know, you never know. You <laughs> never I, would, know. You, I would assume yeah. these things end up on the Doctor Who experience, or there's it in place of them to go. So, yeah, but I, mean, I think they'd, they'd already built a beautiful copy for the Doctor Who experience, so I'm not sure where that, uh, that current one will go. Uh, Marvellous Mitch, we're, yeah. about to, we're about to leave here. I Can I ask you, this, is, this takes up almost, even though we're in an enormous hangar at Studio 4, it still takes up, because the interior of the TARDIS is so big, when you're almost half of the room. Yeah. Um, in the other half of the room, do you film other scenes of Doctor Who, or do you take over another studio for the rest of it? Well, when we're in full swing, we have four studios here. Do but we, Yeah, we, we do take up the other, the other side of this room quite a lot as well. Okay. Um, Mitch, any final thoughts as we leave the TARDIS? Uh, yeah, I don't want to leave the TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> and that was us in the TARDIS about an hour ago. We're in Cardiff at the BBC's Drama Studios here. And you join us now again live in Casualties Pub. Mitch Ben, yeah. I just had a thought. We made a mistake because you are—we're both Doctor Who fans. You're yeah. another level to me. Okay, okay. We should have just left something on the set. It's a little something, or you just, you just, or maybe got a little marker pen and drawn a little dot on the console. Just something that when you saw the show, you would see that we could still. By the way, we can get back in there before we leave. 
But wouldn't that be thrilling? I've got a sci-fi book coming out in July called Terror, and I thought about leaving a copy of it lying about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you changed your mind and thought instead you'd shoehorn a plug for that. So it's 12.48, and we have with us some ex 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 proper Doctor Who fans at an, a level even beyond Mitch Ben from BBC Radio 4's The Now Show. Um, so as you, we're going to examine why the Doctor Who has worked so well and why it has lasted 50 years. It is the 50th anniversary this year. It was November 1963 when William Hartnell first appeared as the Doctor in an episode called An Unearthly Child. <laughs> that opens the door. You still think this is a trick? I know that free movement in the fourth dimension of space and time is a scientific dream I didn't expect to find solved in a junkyard. For your science, schoolmaster, not for ours. I tell you, before your ancestors turned the first wheel, the people of my world had reduced movement through the farthest reaches of space to a game for children. Unless you open that door and let me take Susan and Miss Wright out of here, I'll... Don't threaten me, young man. Grandfather, he doesn't understand. Let them go now. What if it is true? Well, it can't be, I tell you. Are you going to open that door? All right. I'll have to take a chance myself. Very well, I can't stop you. <gasps> I've never seen that episode. It sounds great. That was broadcast fact fans the day after JFK was assassinated. Um, Anthony Weiner is here from the Doctor Appreciation Society. Anthony, good afternoon. Good afternoon. As, as well as Justin Richards, the creative consultant on Doctor Who books and the author of plenty of Doctor Who fictional novels, among them Plague of the Cybermen, and Gavin Fuller joins me as well. Hello, Gavin. And you, are, you write about Doctor Who for the Daily Telegraph. I didn't know that the Daily Telegraph had a Doctor Who correspondent. Uh, well, I've sort of fallen into the role because I, I also went on Mastermind with it as a specialist subject, so they think I know something about the programme as a result when wanting somebody to write about it. You're a true enthusiast. You have the voice I would expect a Doctor Enthusiast to have. Mitch Ben, mm -hmm. you're here as well. I am. Do you think, we played that clip there, um, of the first ever episode. You know, if you go back to that first episode, and I imagine, Gavin, you, you know it well, because you won Mastermind with Doctor Who knowledge. <laughs> Are all of the ingredients there that, that, that you see in the show today? Um... Probably not that first episode because it's a scene, it's a scene setter. You've got the it, what it does it sets the mystery up. Who is this strange old man who has a police box, which is mysteriously bigger inside the house, and allegedly can fly in time and space? Of course, then you didn't know it was going to happen. It was only at the end of the first episode it happened, and it all went on from there. Okay, and then some of the other ingredients came to the show as it went on. So, for example, the regeneration wasn't there at the beginning. I think. Mitch, you're, you're already keen to answer this question because you know where I'm going. The regeneration was born of the fact that William, William Arnold just decided to leave and they wanted to carry on with the show. Well, it wasn't really well enough to keep going. I mean, the thing is, he was actually not a very well guy. Uh, and after about three years, it became apparent that he just wasn't going to go on. So they had this ingenious idea that, do we not the show on the air? Do we get rid of that character and see if the character can show and keep going without him? Or, given that we have yet to define who or what species this guy is, shall we just say that when he gets a bit clapped out, he turns into someone cheaper? <laughs> and, uh, and, that's, and, that's, and, that's, and that's been a facet of time love biology ever since. And that was probably one of the single cleverest ideas they had, just right there. They just say, you may set up a show that could theoretically keep going forever. But the, re the real, Justin Richards, the real reason, I suppose, it's a success is, and we touched on this earlier, is because in the, the premise can go anywhere. It is what you can do with this uh, old chap and his police box that goes back and forth in time is limitless. That's exactly right. As a as a writer, it's a gift. It's an it's an excuse to write whatever story you want. Now you've got the central character. You have to get in there and uh, whatever assistant or companion he's got. But apart from that, you can you can go anywhere. You can do anything. You can tell any kind of story. So they've done drama. They've done comedy. They've done tragedy, uh, and completely off the wall wacky stories that no other series could ever come close to. What's that? that's, that's the appeal, I think. What you weren't prepared to say who the weakest Doctor Who was earlier, <laughs> Mitch Ben. You were saying you think some, in some ways Colin Baker is unfairly I, I maligned. He, I think he got the rawest deal, certainly. And yeah. also the Sylvester McCoy episodes looked like they had less money, didn't they, at that point? I think they probably did have less yeah. money at this point. I think, I think it's, it's, it's generally accepted that the BBC was kind of losing faith with Doctor Who in the back half of the 80s. Which it was, which it definitely yeah. was. And it was cancelled by Michael Gray, wasn't it, who himself... Had, I mean, in a way... He, he would, you, I imagine Doctor Who fans would say, mm -hmm. 
to Michael Grade, mm -hmm. you were wrong. And they were all, I imagine you were all very upset when Michael Grade cancelled it, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, so it's yeah, almost yeah. still raw. Look yeah, at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your body language has changed. Um, but yeah, look, tensing up, clenching fists. But I think he would say, I wasn't wrong. Actually, it was a bit tired in the 1980s when I cancelled it. And that gap allowed the show itself to regenerate and come back better and stronger. Yes, I mean, it had been on the television for nearly 23 years at that point. So, yeah, there had been lots of stories that had already been told, I suppose. So, yeah, that can be justified, I suppose. But, of course, we all know that the central concept of the programme is fantastic. As Justin said, the Doctor can go anywhere. So there's always thousands and hundreds of thousands of stories to tell. How long, Gavin, was your self Imposed moaning, self-imposed uh, mourning, rather, when uh, Michael Gray cancelled the show? Uh, well, he, Michael Gray, are you talking about the 86 hiatus, the 85 yeah. 86 hiatus, or back in, 18, in then 89 when it got cancelled? When it got cancelled. Permanently, yeah. so we thought at the time. How long? Was I, well, the thing was, they didn't actually ever say they'd cancelled it. They said it was being vested, and they kept on promising it would come back. And mysteriously, this promise would never, never, never come out. So <laughs> it was a limbo state. So you couldn't really mourn something because you just didn't know what was going to happen with it. You could also, <laughs> you know, you got a sense of the passion for Doctor Who by the fact that. When it was off air, when it came off air in 89, people like you guys carried on writing stories anyway, that fans just kept bringing out stories in books, in magazines, in newspapers, online. You can't imagine, with the greatest of respect to Casualty, whose set we are on right now, <laughs> I can't imagine if that was cancelled, fans would keep on writing episodes of Casualty. Oh, I'm sure some of them would, but I think uh, it's the end of the, end of the day. I mean, what, what is, is, it eventually happened is ultimately the fan fiction became the show. And, and it's, it's and by and large... Stephen Moffat, yeah. essentially... He's, he's, he's was a huge fan of Doctor Who. Oh, yeah, so for him, it's, it's, he's writing fan fiction. Of course. It? Well, essentially what Doctor Who currently is, is fan fiction with a badge, if you want to put it like that. I mean, this is, the people who are currently making the show were the people who were doing the fan fiction and the first sort of unofficial audio adventures, which eventually became the official audio adventures. These are the people who sort of kept, kept it going for the whole time it was on, and they've ended up kind of inheriting it now that it's brought back. And entirely rightly so. That's, that's, that's how it should work. OK, guys. Well, we'll talk to you a bit more a little, little bit later. We are just before the news here. It's five minutes till the news. We're going to play the tape of when Marcus Wilson, the series producer, took myself and Mitch Ben from BBC Radio 4's The Now Show from the interior of the TARDIS, which we've already heard, over to the Daleks' cage. We're in the prop stores. Mitch yeah. is playing with a Dalek. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm touching a Dalek and I probably shouldn't be. Oh, this is, I love the bronze ones. They were a lovely design. Is it? Now, let's, Marcus, Marcus, let's explain what's going on here. This is a bronze Dalek. Now, first of all, let's do yeah. more about our location. So we have come, we are a sort of about 30 seconds walk from Studio 4 where the TARDIS is, down a corridor into, we're going into a metal cage. We call this the Dalek cage. <laughs> and they just get yeah. one cage? They just get one cage. We don't actually have that many. We keep blowing them up. There aren't many. I mean, they're in this Dalek cage, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the one out just outside, eight. There's, so you only own eight Daleks. We only own eight Daleks. How yeah. are they meant to take over the world? Through very careful assistance from the mill, our CGI company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, if, you, if you notice on Doctor Who, uh, it's always small numbers that invade the Earth. Yes. Yeah, so we did. And this is Mitch can make him in. This, yeah, is, yeah. this is thrilling, isn't it? You're in a Dalek's cage. You're in a Dalek's, in a Dalek's cage. Dalek's cage yeah. That already sounds like the title of a Doctor Who episode. It could, well, I mean, it very, very nearly was the Asylum cage. You know, the Asylum of the Daleks very, very nearly was an entitled of a Doctor Who story. Uh, you know, we've got bits and bobs. We've got um, there's, there's, there's a, a complete bronze Dalek sort of out in the corridor. We've got two slightly distressed looking bronze Daleks with yeah. bits missing. And we've got the component parts of four, which the fans refer to as the eye Daleks, so the new generation ones, the sort of the, the big multicolored, slightly weird hunchbacked ones. Which I'm getting slightly confused. I remember there was an episode that I think was written by Mark Gatiss, it was, wasn't yes. there? In which he introduced some new multicolored Daleks. Yeah. Is that what these are? These are these are the ones, yes. Is there a classic Dalek in here? I'm not seeing a classic one. They had a couple kicking around in Asylum. Do you um, not own any classic Daleks? No, all the classic ones have gone back to the experience. Is that, is that where yeah. you got them from? For a so well, the BBC do own some, but they go out, out around various BBC buildings. But also, yeah. the thing is, there's a certain hardcore of Doctor Who fan who build their own Daleks. Yeah. So if you ever need any classic look Daleks, probably the fastest way is to get them off the fans. <laughs> um, You're probably right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think someone turned up to a Doctor Who Comic Con convention and sat in the front row dressed as a TARDIS. Um, <laughs> 
There is, Marcus. Everyone's got a TARDIS yeah. dress. <laughs> My friend <laughs> Kelly's got a TARDIS dress. For fans, who, for fans who go out to these things like the Doctor Experience, I suppose they may like the idea that some of the props they see there do feature in the shows rather than being replicas. So what you're saying is some of the classic Daleks, you, actually the show borrows the classic Daleks from the experience. Yeah, we have, we have a great relationship with BBC World where, where, you know, props that we're not using go on display there and yeah. we can borrow them back. Uh, and when we did Asylum, we had a huge collection of physical Daleks on set. I think the most Daleks that have ever been together. So we got those from various sources, including... Uh, Receptions yeah. of BBC buildings. Including and then they that, just yeah. go back exactly. out. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so looking around, Mitch, there's, yeah. uh, there's a look a bit of old... Is that a bit old TARDIS set there? That's... Uh, I think... I bet you, is that not the photo that was stuck inside the police box to be in the background when people were looking at the police box in a couple of seasons ago? Is that yeah. what that is? That's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah that's it's what it's so good. <laughs> that's the, uh, you the really are good at this. We have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yeah. a sort of big illuminated backdrop of a bit of TARDIS yeah. contour room to stand in front of. And yeah. just whilst we're here, how, how big is this cage room, would you say, Mitch? It's not very big. I mean, no. it's about the size of a sort of, you know, one of those storage places that you rent by the month, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's, it's kind of what it is. You, you, yeah. uh, what else have we got here? There's a gravestone there. The, the, what's that sort of terrifying female statue there's, with the fangs? What is that? There's bits of Weeping Angel. There's bits of Weeping Angel, yeah. So bits of fiber glass weeping angel there's also what looks like the mold for something which what i suspect might be the title of an as yet unbroadcast episode written on it in marker which i'm not going to read out okay hello. marcus uh, is now slightly is nervously like looking at that it's a do no. Forget it. no scoop here folks it's a yeah. doctor who the crooked man that yeah, would yeah, be a good yeah, name yeah. for an episode yeah, exactly, but marcus i ask you again mm -hmm. given that you've now been into the prop store where they keep the daleks uh -huh. and inside the daleks yeah. is this has this overtaken the birth of your children <laughs> as the happiest day of your life? It's getting there, it's certainly getting there, yes.